you sit there shaking in your boots. You can't believe that you're up here getting ready to talk in front of all these people. You feel your heart pounding and your hands trembling. And you might just explode. You douse yourself in gasoline and light yourself on fire. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> Welcome to Psychology at the Table. This is a special Game Hole Con episode. You see, not at my usual set because we are yes. in Wisconsin. And I am joined by none other than Chris Burke. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for coming and talking Yeah, for absolutely. This. So uh, we want to talk to you today because you and I have something in common, which is we both struggle a bit with anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, predominantly with me, it's not in like uh, private social situations. Mm -hmm. It's being on stage in front of a bunch of people you don't know and performing a D&D game live. Which is something you do yeah. very often. Right. And to, I mean, to a much, much lesser extent, streaming yeah. online. So tell me a little bit about what your experience of anxiety is and how it manifests for you. So worst case scenario, let's, let's talk about any of the mm -hmm. live games. Um, it, I'm not anxious when we're kind of talking about the idea in concept, when we're mm -hmm. brainstorming what we're going to do, and like months and months ahead, planning everything. Yeah. I'm totally cool with all that preparation stuff, but about two to three weeks before the show, that's when the anxiety descends upon me like mm -hmm. a rock and tries to carry me away. And during those weeks leading up to the show, um, my work is impacted, of course, because I'm thinking about the show all the time and I'm freaking out about why did I do, why did I agree to do this again? <laughs> why am I, do, am I, are, are the causes for doing this more than the, the detriments of putting myself out there? And I'm just going through this kind of mental maelstrom mm -hmm. uh, for those weeks during which my productivity goes down and um, my sleep habits change. And it culminates, if that's the word for it, in the half hour show before the curtain rises. Right. And I've been given, you know, things I'm supposed to say, things I'm not supposed to say, things mm -hmm. I'm, I've planned to say for yeah. the game experience, uh, keeping in mind like story beats and trying to think about, okay, this is how I think the story is going to go, but it, this is all improv, so it might go this way, it might go that way. I have no control, mm -hmm. as it turns out. And I'm probably in a ridiculous costume. <laughs> 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 As you do, for and I know it's gonna. I know it's you know this this D and D this D and D live game thing is sort of really it took off mm -hmm. much more so than I ever expected, and to the point where you know you're standing on the stage at Benaroya Hall and there's thousands of people staring at you, um, hanging off your words, and you don't even know what your words are because there's no script. Right. Uh, so the most terrifying period is the five minutes before the curtain rises because usually I'm the first one out on stage because mm -hmm. I play the role of the dungeon master and the dungeon yeah. master is like the the story leader mm -hmm. who's kind of shepherding the story along. And so I'm going to be the first one out there. I'm going to bring the others out on stage around me, usually after I've said some sort of monologue or opening spiel that either I've come up with myself or has been fed to me from other individuals. And it's that five minutes on stage, standing by myself behind the curtain, when I am all just, I'm, I feel like I'm almost on another plane. Yeah. I've, I've completely lost my sense of self and bearing, and I'm just kind of freaking out. Mm -hmm. And then the curtain rises, and I'm still freaking out, but all I can think about is I've got to pull this off, and I have to just get through it. Um, and then by the time the game starts, it's all gone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because now I'm back to doing the natural thing, which is just sitting at a table with my friends and enjoying a game and everything else just sort of fades away into darkness and I completely forget, usually, yeah. uh, until the first uproarious cloud, laughter mm -hmm. or whatever, that, I'm, that there are other people in the room. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, and, then, and then just being on stage with so many funny, gifted people. Yeah, because your players are amazing. Yeah, particularly like in the Acquisitions Inc. game and in the, the Dice Camera Action games, I've got really, really expressive mm -hmm. people on stage with me. And some of them are very gifted comedians. And I fear at some level that I shouldn't be there with them. Yeah. Like they would be better served by having somebody else. Is there that imposter that syndrome? Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, and I can say, you know, I've got years of experience as a game designer and as a writer and all that, but I am not a stage performer. I have no real stage performer cred. Mm -hmm. I took no drama classes, nothing. So I do feel like an imposter up there. And uh, it is only by the grace of their support and the audience's, you know, general tolerance that I, I sort of get through it all. 
Yeah. And at the end, it's funny, I hardly remember what happened. <laughs> I'm so consumed by the anxiety and mm-hmm. the just improvising on stage in the moment and having to, uh, the brain works so hard to stay a couple paces ahead right. of what's going on, anticipating what the players are going to do so that you're ready uh, to react, that by the end, I'm just, my brain can't handle it. And people will come to me and will say, I really love that part where this happened. And I'm like, did that happen? Like, did I do that? Yeah. Did I do that? Was that me? Like, I have this yeah, so strange that, like, attachment fight, to it. Whole like fight or flight, and your brain's just like, exactly. Reacting yeah, and it's very much a fight or flight response. Yeah, it's good. it reminds me what you're describing reminds me a little bit of actually uh, so one of my favorite books, of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, when he mm-hmm. talks about his anticipation of fighting a dragon. Yes. And how much worse the anticipation was than the actual fight. Right. Yes. Because once you're consumed in an activity and all of the chemicals are, mm-hmm. all, you get all these chemicals rushing through your body, it's a completely different experience than the chemicals that are dumped into you in the moments leading up yeah. to that. And I feel like uh, that, you know, three weeks up until curtain rise are just the worst three weeks of my year. Yeah, well, it's that energy with no place to go. Yeah, I guess that's a good way to look at it. There really isn't. You're kind of storing it up to sort of let it all out. Mm-hmm. Um, on stage and I've actually um, I think become a little bit better with it over the years just through regularity yeah because it's it's something that I anticipate happens now more mm-hmm. often that I can I, I'm I'm my I'm much e- more able to trick my brain into just sort of getting through it yeah now, do you do things where like when you know it's getting three weeks out to a game going okay my productivity is gonna go to crap so I need to make sure I'm getting more stuff done and not taking on as yes. many things for those three weeks. Yeah, yeah. Usually, usually it's very good for me to have a one or two things to really focus my creative energies on and to be interested in them. Mm-hmm. Um, so usually, since our conventions almost always collide with our deadlines through <laughs> just the way you know things work, um, and I almost always have a deadline around the same time that a show. Mm-hmm. is going on. So I do have a another sort of pressure distraction right. to help me out. And I know I can't blow that deadline. So um, I, I find for myself that's something that really helps is when I can because that anxiety like you're saying is there's this energy with nowhere to go. Right. And if you can and channel so you that can energy channel into, into another something. project, yeah. It works yeah. really well. Yeah. And I don't know if I don't know if that anxiety ends up being better words on the page, mm-hmm. but it it has helped me crank out yeah. Words. Yeah. I yeah. know it's one of the reasons I, I can do so much is like I have a high level of anxiety yeah. and it's just like, okay, let's throw it into this project and that project and this mm-hmm. thing and over here. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, do you find you work better in like the mornings or the evenings as far as? More for the work? mornings. That seems to be when my brain's quieter. Okay. And then as the day goes on, my brain gets noisier and noisier and yeah. noisier. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty much the same. Yeah. 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 It's, in, it's interesting how that works. Yeah. Now, for when you're live streaming, like how... How does your anxiety manifest for that? Is it different or is it about the same? Or It's, uh, it's no, it's, it's much, much lower. Mm-hmm. And I think part of that is there's, there's the, the barrier between, you're not standing out there on the stage and there's right. nothing between you and the audience. And part of it too is I can't see the audience. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, I'm, if I have the chat room right. open, I can. But generally when I'm running on a stream, I don't look at that. So it's, it's really just um, me and my players and we know that you know through the through the the, the window people are looking in and watching right. it happen, but it, it doesn't freak me out the same way. I think uh, part of it is too. More of the streaming is under my direct control. Mm-hmm. There's not a whole crew backstage hanging off my every word and shining lights on me and um, standing off stage to make sure that I wrap things up on time. Right. You know. Uh, and all that other business. So I feel like there's less dependency mm-hmm. on, on me executing well. If I have a bad live stream game or I'm a little tired or whatever, yeah, I have another, it's a regular thing. So I, you know, it's just, well, that one wasn't so great, but next week's will be fine. Or, yeah. you know, I can. So your brain's pretty good at not beating you up if you make a mistake. Correct. Or something. Yeah. You're like, yeah. Yeah. My brain loves to beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, I have a group of players who are so. Uh, likable and accommodating mm-hmm. and and can really kind of help carry the show. I don't feel like there's a tremendous burden on me. Mm-hmm. And because I don't have to, 
I mean, we have a t- we have a time limit on every show, but if mm-hmm. something doesn't finish, I have next week to pick it up. Right. There's not the big okay. I have to get all this wrapped up in this 90 minutes, and yeah. then that's it, and then everybody walks away. Uh, so I don't have to feel like there was the full arc of the mm-hmm. story that played out, and there were the right number of peaks and valleys, and all the other things that are going through my heads as a narrator and a storyteller. Yeah. Uh, that come with a live game. And so I find I find the pressure is is much lower, uh, and um, I must admit when I first started off live streaming, I was a little bit intimidated by the technology because mm-hmm. I had never used Twitch or Zoom or any yeah. of these devices before. I'd always had the luxury of playing with my players face to face, not players in different cities. All we're looking at cameras. I can't see their dice rolls. There's that um, the intimacy yeah. of being in the same space is lost. And I thought that would be a tremendous barrier and would affect me as a DM. But it turns out that the technology has gotten good enough and reliable enough now that my brain almost tricks me into thinking they are in the room. Yeah, yeah. Most of the games I play for fun are, well, and even my streamed game, it's everybody's Mm -hmm. in different cities. Well, no, that's not true. My players are all in the same city at the same table. But you are elsewhere. I am elsewhere. (laughs) Okay. Uh, but it, it is still like that nice, intimate experience yeah, of yeah. people connecting. And I think as the as the technology continues to improve, it'll feel less like a barrier for a lot of people. And mm-hmm. uh, so getting over that initial technological fear uh, of of not being in the same room, was that happened surprisingly quickly. Yeah. I think after my first three or four sessions, I'm like, oh, this is going to be fine. This yeah. is just like... So it sounds like the things that have really helped you is like, one, learning your... Um, your pattern, right? And so understanding yes. what your pattern is and then working around that pattern. So, because, you know, obviously, like, we'd love it if we could go, like, if this could just go away, it'd be great. But we can also sometimes understand, like, this is something I have to deal with and I have to work with. Yeah. I mean, nobody is forcing me, nobody's holding me at sword point and right. saying, you must do this. Um, but after, after doing several shows, particularly with Acquisitions Inc., uh, it's, it's brought a, a tremendous number of new people into the role-playing game mm-hmm. industry. It's dispelled a lot of myths yeah. of what yeah. D&D is. It's demystified the game to the extent that DMs feel like, oh, I don't need to know all the rules and everything to play. I can just get my friends and we can just go and have fun. It's easy. Mm-hmm. I just watched it on TV. It looks it's the easiest thing in the world. Um, and I, I, the thing that gets me doing it year after year is I've had some very personal fan response from people who have much more difficult lives than I have. They may be, they may have served overseas in Afghanistan or Iran, or you know, they, they may be dealing with family crises that I don't have to deal with because I'm a single person. Mm-hmm. I don't have children um, or dependents or anything like that. And I hear how this game, this experience, this show that I've put on has helped them. And it makes me think, okay, there's more to this than just the game. Yeah. It's not just me on stage having fun with my friends. People are getting something out of this that's important to them, that's getting them through their crises. Yeah. And because of that, I can say, you know, my fears, my insecurities, my anxieties do not are pale in comparison mm-hmm. to what's happening out there. And if people can get that much out of this game, then, yeah, I should just do it. Yeah. Just get up there and do it. Well, there's a great quote of like, he who has a why can withstand any how. Yes, that's really good. Yeah. Right. So you, I, have, uh, you have a reason for, for facing your anxieties. And you yeah. have a good reason to go yeah. through it. Yeah. One of my, one of the sort of icons in my life as a, as a person I sort of look to, and this is going to be, this is going to sound really strange, but um, <laughs> we all get our heroes from everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but regardless of what you thought or think of her politics, Margaret Thatcher was hugely influential on me. Um, as a Canadian boy growing mm-hmm. up in a colony. Um, <laughs> and only because uh, the perseverance that she had, the determination that she had, the, the wherewithal to basically say, this is going to be terrible, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, you know, um, I mean, her, her phrase is basically just get on with it. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like, that's become my mantra of life, particularly yeah. in social experiences is, I don't necessarily like this, but I'm just going to get on with it. Yeah. And, and it's fine. You know, you punch mm-hmm. through it or you get through it. And even some bad experience, it falls into the past and then you just keep marching forward. I think the, the thing is just keep marching forward. It's definitely. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Any other final thoughts or tips or tricks that you would recommend to anybody who might be struggling with anxiety? And yeah, imagining other people naked never works. <laughs> no, I have not found that to work at all. <laughs> uh, I think I think that um, in the case of a in a case of a DMD experience, just trust that you know if you like the people that you're with, mm -hmm. they will help you. They will be there for you, and they're not going to pounce on you if you fail or if you get nervous or if you stutter or if you screw up an encounter and it doesn't play out the way you initially ran it or you're trying to interpret a monster and you just sort of run things wrong or if they run roughshod over your story. I think if you have good friends who you surround yourself with that and you and you have if you're on stage you have just good people competent experts backstage doing their job to the best of their ability then I think that takes a lot of the burden off mm -hmm. you. It's not a social anxiety isn't a fight of that you have to fight alone. Yeah. And I think it you often forget that some of that anxiety is going to just get absorbed mm -hmm. away by the people around you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well thank you so much for coming on and talking. Yeah, about thanks for this. letting me just blab on about, no, this is great. about my this <laughs> these crazy experiences that I've had that I never <laughs> ever thought in a million years I'd be doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting the way where life can take you. Yeah, yeah. I thought, you know, I'm going to go on a quest to do D and D, but make D and D games for the rest of my life. Never, never would have thought that people would actually want to watch yeah. other people play the game and just sort of enjoy it as a social thing. And so, um, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. I hope this was helpful for you guys. If you have questions, please leave them below. And as always, let's make space at the table for everyone.